What's going on, Junkie Nation? Gorgeous George and Goes reporting for duty here on a Monday. Excited to talk to you with Kenny Florian and discuss PFL 10 2023 PFL World Championship. It's on Friday, the 24th, the day after Thanksgiving, Black Friday. It's going to be a fun time with six title fights and some nice key pivotal fights featuring some of the greatest, some of the best PFL talent. Kenny, of course, color commentator now for a few years with PFL. What's up, Kenny? How are you? I'm well. How are you guys doing? Doing great, man. We're getting ready for the big event, PFL 10, their finals. Wanted to ask you, you've been a part of some big cards, including title fights and all that. Tell me, um, how do they compare? I mean, we get six at once over here. You know what I mean? It's different from the other uh, promotions that we cover where sometimes yeah. we get one, sometimes two. But this is six. Like, that's pretty intense. A absolutely. Yeah. I think what, what makes this a little bit different, what differentiates this from, say, like other events, other championship fights uh, that I've been able to be a part of is, you know, again, these, these are six world championships in one night. So not only is it a world championship, th these are individuals who have been able to withstand the grind, get to the end of the year. It's been a culmination of build up to this point. And, and six fighters' lives are going to change, you know, uh, no question about it. What's the closest year that you remember that you had that resembled the PFL season where you can tell us, hey, look, I've kind of been through something similar? Gosh, um, as far as things that, as a you know, like, like maybe four fights or three fights in a year that led towards either a, a title contender fight or a title fight itself. Did you ever have anything like that, like that, you know, where – uh, your body was through the ringer, which I imagine how some of these fighters are going to be, you know, staggering to the finish line, maybe. Right. Yeah, I'm trying to think. I think I did, let's see, either three or four fights over the course of eight months or something like that. And and that was pretty tough. You know, I, I think that it's one thing to do the fights. And again, people kind of forget about this. Is it's the preparation for the fight. You know, the training camps are such a grind. Um, especially if you're talking about, you know, getting ready for a five rounder, it's just a whole different type of training camp. You're doing a lot more, or in my case, it, it, it was a lot more. You're doing more rounds. Um, you're doing more conditioning. Uh, so your body is just that much more tired. And I can't, I can't even imagine it. And for some of the guys like Ibuk Saganai or Gabriel Braga, this is their fifth fight. This is the fifth fight, like, since March in some cases, which is, like, my body hurts just thinking about that. <laughs> yeah, no doubt. Um, you've been with the PFL for a few years now. What's something you appreciate that doesn't get talked about that maybe you'd like to give it some shine? Uh, you guys are always innovative over there. Yeah, you know, I think that the production team should be applauded because they are really always trying to do something a little bit different, right? I think they're trying to separate themselves um, from, from other promotions. So obviously there's the setup, um, how, how it is different, their format is very different, but production-wise, they're always looking to try to push the envelope and try different things. Um, and George Greenberg is a guy that I've known over when he was at Fox Sports, and he's just one of the best guys in the business, period. And um, yeah, always willing to try to do different things and uh, being open-minded. And uh, for that, it, it, it's awesome to be a part of. I'm glad you brought it up. I'll just echo something, then goes as a few questions. It is awesome when they go and send it to a fight party at a bar or yeah. that fighter's house, especially when it's foreign territory and to see that passion and those people riding with that fighter, if it's Greenberg that gets the credit for that. I think that's outstanding. Yeah, cool. Kenny, I want to talk to you a little bit about OAM. George brought up a very good point in the last time we interviewed him that we had just not really thought of to this moment. But can you maybe share where you think he ranks mm -hmm. in Canadian MMA, the, the fighters that have been produced? Because obviously GSP pops out as number one. Right. Uh, but OAM, man, those credentials... Is he number two? Is he number three? I mean, he's right there, isn't he? And no question about it. I, I think he's, well, without a question, top five. But certainly, I, I think there's a, a strong argument that he's top three, right? You have Rory McDonald, George St. Pierre, um, and and he still 
has a bunch of years ahead of him, I think. You know, I think when you talk about his overall game, his durability, his intelligence, uh, and now his finishing ability, the dude is an absolute problem. His size, he's massive as a, as a lightweight. Um, and it seems like he always has an answer. And now he's gotten to the point, confidence-wise, momentum-wise, where uh, he can pick you apart and then finish you. Uh, whereas before, he'd kind of pick you, pick you apart, outsmart you, outpoint you. Um, but now he's really coming into his own as a mixed martial artist. And um, as we mentioned, having four fights in a calendar year is no joke. This is his second time doing that. Being a back-to-back PFL champion is something that is extremely difficult to do. Not many have done it. Um, he's on his way to, to do that. And Clay Collard is is a very dangerous dude, so not going to be easy getting by him. Um, but OEM um, is, is certainly going to be a favorite heading into that fight. And it's a real pleasure seeing him fight. He's just he's very smart. He, he knows how to out calculate you and we don't really see him get hurt too often and balancing all those things shows that he's really getting close to a level of mastery for sure kenny there are a few storylines going into these fights that i wanted to get your opinion on as far as what goes on in your head i know leading up to a fight you know if we if we look at oam he's kind of brought it out there he said he's thinking about retirement you look at Kayla Harrison and having the opponent switch and having to bounce back. There's so many little storylines. But at the end of the day, when that when that cage door closes, does it all go away or does a little piece of it still resonate within you? Yeah, you know, that's a great question. I think it certainly shouldn't be there. Um, in my experience, it, it's ultra important to be as present as possible when you're doing something as dangerous as mixed martial arts fighting. And if you do carry any of that in, in, into the cage with you, it can actually detract you from what you're trying to do, right? I, I think in, in some ways it can be motivating, right? Just knowing, hey, this is my last fight or this could be my last fight. But I, I also feel like that's something that you should feel anyway, Right, because what you're you're one injury away from maybe never competing again. Um, so, but in in some cases, I think it can add a lot of unneeded pressure. Um, and your goal as a mixed martial artist is to focus on that person in front of you who is genuinely trying to hurt you. So, I, I think that uh, in some cases, it, it's not advantageous to to bring that in with you. Um, and, but that that's. That's what being a professional athlete is, right? It's kind of like, how do I get my outside life, whatever is going on outside of the cage or outside of the professional athlete sphere, um, so I can just focus on this task at hand. And the best professional athletes are the ones who are able to take that out and just kind of be present in the moment. And um, not always an easy thing to do. I wish I'd say, say that I, you know, I mastered that over the course of my career. I certainly did not. Kenny, the father-son relationship coach fighter we see that in boxing quite a bit throughout history in mma we don't see it that often it has happened but we don't see it too often with josh silveria can you uh do you do you have an explanation as to maybe why we don't see that as much in mixed martial arts as we do in boxing yeah i would say first of all that boxing is a much older sport um so i think it's a little bit more common um i also think that you know, we probably have, I guess at this stage of the game, maybe more, um, you know, or have had more boxers that end up being coaches. I think now we're kind of seeing that new crop of former mixed martial arts fighters that are, are turning into coaching. Not, not a whole lot have gone that route. And I'm sure, you know, not a whole lot have had kids that are actually going that route. So the, just that dynamic, I think, is a bit more rare. But I got to say, you know, without getting too cheesy or too emotional, like, it's beautiful to see that relationship between Josh and Conan. And I don't know how Conan's able to really keep his calm and composure throughout that process. You know, um, he, he says when, I'm, when we're going out there on fight week, he's like, I am coach. As soon as that fight is over, he goes, I go back to being daddy again. And, um, you know, Finding those roles and sticking to them isn't very, 
you know, easy for a lot of people. And the way that ma- that Conan has been able to manage that and the way that Josh has been able to do that uh, as well it is a huge credit to their family. Um, obviously, they have a very close relationship. Um, but, you know, for, for a lot of us, you know, it's hard for you to take advice from dad, you know, right? And, and um, I think that comes from just raising your kid right, having that beautiful and open relationship. And seeing that dynamic between Josh and Conan has been amazing. And seeing how he's matured since last year is also extremely impressive. So um, it's hard not to like Josh or, or his dad for that matter. They're, they're, Conan's been one of those guys that I've always been extremely impressed with, his kindness and, and how he approaches people. Um, he's a scary looking, du- scary looking dude, but uh, man, what a, what a gentle giant he is. Kenny, you've seen up close and on TV when Joe Rogan looks into the eyes of the fighters as, as they're doing their stare down, and then he's got to do the quick interview. How about you on fight week? Do you have any type of routine, whether it's a question you might ask the fighter or a look that kind of just kind of gives you a feel either who is looking more prepared or more nervous or anything like that? Yeah, that, that's a good thing. I don't know if it's any one thing. One common question that I, that I try to ask, just because I, I do think it's a good, a, a relatively good indicator, not maybe a perfect indicator of what's going on mentally or how a fighter prepares. But I always ask a fighter if they are if they watch a video on their opponent or not. And and I always I ask that question. I also ask why. Um, and some people will say, oh, I don't like getting into the head of my opponent. I, I'm going to do what I'm going to do. So I don't watch any fight. Games, right? I always say that person's not prepared um, in, in my mind. If they say, um, I don't watch it because, you know, I, I let my, uh, my coaches do that um, and whatever, like, okay, that's, that's a little bit better of an answer. Um, I, I think those that are watching with a very clinical eye and are able to separate their emotions from the fight and say, I'm watching this because I want to get a good handle on what they're doing. And I I think that's more interesting to me. And it shows that maybe they're a little bit more in tune, a little bit more confident, but certainly, you know, that's not always a perfect indicator, right? I, I think body language, as you mentioned, is huge. The things that they say, the way that they say it, um, you know, whether it's eye contact, uh, certain intensity, um, tightness in their body, um, you know, little things like that, um, I, I think are always good indicators. And a lot of times it's just what they don't say that kind of communicates more, right? Just how their body reacts and how they're kind of walking around fight week shows, whether they're relaxed, tense, nervous, all those things. Um, but again, even that, not perfect. It, fighting and, you know, doing, you know, Figuring out what the what the result could be is uh, it, it's certainly not a science. It is so difficult for me, anyways, to to pick a fight. Who's going to win? Who's going to lose? And why it's going to happen? Um, you know, so many times the better fighter does not win. Um, mm-hmm. You know, whether it's injuries or just the way fights play out. You know, lame judges' decision. I mean, there's just so much that goes on in this sport. Uh, it, it's uh, I I can't figure it out as far as picking fights. Right, I'll tell you that right now. Let's end with this. Can you explain to the audience something we hear a lot in fighting when color commentators are chiming in and talk, talking strategic? See if you can apply it to Magomed Karamov versus C, Sadabu C. Ooh, I'm really intrigued okay. by this matchup. Faints, the word faints. Um, I imagine Sadabu would be more comfortable standing all 25 if he has to, right? And he's going to face a guy that is pretty dangerous on the ground and has become dangerous on the feet as well but yeah. what what can what purpose do the feints have for either party where you may have picked up at least i think i have a little bit um and what it does since again you've studied film and been in the cage yeah no george that's that's a great question it's something that is extremely important i think in fights and i think it's something that is often misunderstood even amongst fighters and i think that the function of a faint is, you know, it kind of works. The, the way I like to explain it is that it works as a disinformation campaign, <laughs> meaning, um, you know, the information that I'm giving you, I want you to, to really question whether the things that I'm doing is either real or not real. 
Um, and the more that you have to process it, the slower you're going to have to be to move and, and react to it. Right. So it's, it's something, let's say, like something simple, like a double leg and an overhand. Just with those two things, if I'm able to threaten with it or at least give the illusion of a threat, then something along the, the, the way is going to falter, meaning you're going to level change when you should. not You're going to drop your hands when you should. Your hands are going to go up high when you should. Then it gives you a double leg. Right. So it's those kind of things that you want to kind of weave a story. You're kind of telling a story to your opponent and lying along the way right you're kind of getting them to jump when they shouldn't or getting them to not jump when they should have jumped right so you're you're really trying to confuse your opponent as much as possible and if you're able to confuse them you're getting you're, you're getting them to kind of follow you and if you're getting them to follow you it doesn't mean you're always going to win but it gets them to kind of like uh fall into some of the things that you're setting them up with so it, it is absolutely essential it seems like it can happen in so many ways, too. Even two guys locked up against the cage. And it looks like it's just going to be a breakaway, right? So that we center ourselves back in the smart cage or the octagon or the ring or whatever yeah. it is. But during that time, you lull them and boom, here comes an elbow. Exactly. 100%. Yeah. And the last thing, I, I know I said last question, but I, one more. Are punches to the side of the head or kicks to the head right here, like temple and then back here? Are they becoming more intentional now or most of the time are they landing there because there was movement from someone's defense? You really were aiming for the button, the chin, and it just happened. Yeah. To, what, 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 are you finding from fighters that they're purposely aiming for the ear or the side of the head? Because so many people just get wobbled by those shots. Uh, dude, another great question. So the, the times I believe, I, I think Diego Nunez caught me in the chin and kind of got me to drop to one knee. But the other times that I've been rocked, like at BJ Penn, uh, one time I was I was in sparring at TriStar, I, I got hit on the side, like kind of like the side of the head, kind of closer to the ear. And those are the ones where you feel like you're either stepping in potholes or there was one time like when BJ hit me, I felt the whole octagon like shift. <laughs> like I felt like it was just like I was in an earthquake a little bit. Um, and, and those have always been the ones that have hurt me the most in, in my experience. And for me, those are the shots that really take away your equilibrium because they, they affect the inner ear, I, I guess. I'm not, not that I'm a medical doctor or anything like that, but I think that it affects your inner ear and takes away your equilibrium, takes away your balance. And um, I think that, listen, I don't think people are purposely, purposely um, in, in my experience, trying to hit behind the head. I think more often than not, it's the f other opposing fighter moving their head at a time where maybe I was trying to catch you in the temple or in the cheek or in the jaw or in the nose. You moved your head and that's on you. That's your bad. Um, if there is no movement, let's say I'm, I'm, I don't know, hitting you and I'm like, you're in the turtle position on the ground and I'm just like whacking away with my elbow in the back of your head. Well, that's a, di that's a different story, right? That would be a, a fault on me. So, um, you know, and sometimes you're just excited. You want to just hit the guy and you don't even realize what you're doing. You know, in a fight, it can get, um, you kind of get your blinders on a little bit. So th there's a lot going on there. Um, but I do think it's oftentimes a more effective strike than say relying on and hitting someone in the jaw and just knocking them out. Because it, I do think it, it affects your overall body when you hit and you're able to affect that inner ear. So I don't think people are doing it on purpose. But, um, yeah, those are the shots that I think that uh, can change a fight in an instant. For sure. I know there's going to be a lot of great techniques on the 24th, and that's why we'll be tuning in. It is a pay-per-view, folks. $49.99 gets you six title fights, the return of Kayla Harrison, the debut of Derek Brunson. So they've definitely done their job on their end, stacking the card. This is Kenny Florian, of course, who will be on the color commentating team, along with Randy Couture, Sean O'Connell. They do a great job. And uh, thank you, as always, Kenny, for the time here on MMA Junkie Radio, man. Break a leg, and uh, we'll see you on the 24th. Always great talking to you guys. Thanks.